Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, after uh, our chilly supper last night, uh, that kind of event, you know, I always think of the harvest, and it's that kind of a season, and uh, that ties us into uh, to Thanksgiving. Although, to be uh, really fair, we need to say happy almost Thanksgiving, because uh, it's not quite here yet, but you know, it's only a month away. Uh, we always observe the Sunday before Thanksgiving is kind of Thanksgiving Sunday, four Sundays, uh, it, it'll be here this time uh, in four weeks, next month. And so uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to kind of help get us warmed up for Thanksgiving. And so to warm up, uh, I'm going to ask some of you uh, to, to shout out some things that you are thankful for. Kind of get the juices flowing for Thanksgiving. My daughter's here. Yay. Yay. Shot. My four children. All right. Family in general. Family in general. Friends. Family and friends. Health. Health. And that's coming from not the healthiest person in the church family. <laughs> So uh, it tells you a little something. A job. The Lord. Yeah. A roof over my head. All right. Or another apartment over my head, which you really want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, not only a roof, but another, right? Well, um, I had more time than you, because I knew I was going to ask this question. And so I was able to think about it, so I want to take a turn myself and share what I'm thankful for. <clears throat> and I thought about this a lot. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, so I want to share what I'm thankful for. <clears throat> I'm thankful that I'm not like other people, cheating, lying, gossiping. Uh, I, I'm just glad that I'm not like that. Uh, and, and not only that, but, you know, I, do, I don't do those things, but I always go to church, I, I read my Bible, I give good offerings, so I repeat, uh, I am so thankful that I'm not like other people. Uh, that's a, a good feeling to know <coughs> that, uh, that I'm not like them, the sinful people. Now, it occurs to me, um, that maybe, does anyone see anything wrong with my answer? Yes. Boasting. I'm seeing some boasting. Yes. Uh, so I just want to tell you, before you get too critical, I modeled my answer directly from an example that Jesus gave. Uh, I, I just took an example that Jesus gave and just, you know, paraphrased it a little bit. I took that directly, so I want to invite you to look at it with me. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. Luke chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. Page 851, if you're using a worship Bible. Uh, Luke 18, verses 11 and 12. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God... I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. So I modeled my thanksgiving prayer directly from that. I, I changed a couple of the sins, you know, but made it mine, but... Uh, but that's where I got uh, my model. So uh, you shouldn't be too critical of me if I'm basing my answer on an example that Jesus gave us. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, and I kind of expected Jim to jump up about this time and say, Pastor, you, you've got to look at it in context. <laughs> and to be fair, uh, to be thorough, I've been taught that you should look at the context. 
And so this morning I thought we would look at the, uh, the broader story. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, verses uh, 9 to 14 that, that includes what I just read. Uh, Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, here it comes, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So I find myself with a big uh-oh. Uh, turns out that while it was an example that Jesus gave, he gave it as a bad example. An example of what not to do. So uh, that's not the example that I should have followed. Um, in fact, from the context of this story, we see that the example I used was based on some people who were uh, confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Now, I underline those two things to draw attention to them, that idea of one's own righteousness uh, or self-righteousness and looking down at everyone else. You see, I think those two things go hand in hand. Uh, when one believes in self-righteousness, they believe that, you know, I'm pure, I accomplish this, uh, I'm, I'm righteous. Uh, and then you look and find, see somebody that's a sinner and you think you're superior to that person. You're better than they are. And so you have the Pharisee uh, who, who is apparently noticing the tax collector who's a little distance off. Um, because he includes him. You know, I'm thankful I'm not like other people. He names some sinners. He says, like this tax collector. Uh, and so, you know, he thinks he's better than the tax collector. Uh, he thinks that he's earned his, uh, his righteousness. Uh, <coughs> and so, uh, so part of our message, of course, is we need to be careful uh, not to be self-righteous and, and think ourselves better than other people. You know, you see someone who's a, a, a down-and-out sinner, and, and it's kind of an occupational hazard of, of being a Christian to think, well, I'm better than they are. Um, so you have to be careful. So when you think about Jesus giving two examples, uh, the obvious question is, well, what, what difference does it make? Uh, why was he giving us two to compare? Uh, what is that difference? And, and I think the answer to that is in verse 14. So I'm going to read that again. Uh, the, what is the difference between praying uh, you know, humbly or praying uh, self-righteously? That Jesus summarizes this. I tell you that this man, that is the, the one who prayed, God have mercy on me, a sinner, rather than the other, went home justified before God. So that's the difference. Um, we can uh, kind of summarize that and say that the difference is that the self-righteous, prideful prayer was not effective. Um, he did not go home justified before God. Uh, and if you go home not justified before God, that means you go home guilty before God. And so he had been to the temple. Uh, in fact, he apparently went all the time, or went often, and, uh, and he said that, you know, uh, he uh, fasted twice a week 
And, and part of the reason why that was significant is because like they were supposed to fast, but not that often. And so he was kind of bragging that I fast more than I'm supposed to. And then they also had these rules about giving a tenth of certain things at certain times. And uh, he kind of wanted to break, he gave a tenth of everything. So he wasn't going to, to, you know, mix something by, by not tithing on it. He was going to tithe on everything. Uh, and so, uh, so he's kind of, uh, Marcia's word, boasting. Uh, but he was boasting to God. Uh, he was reminding God about how good he was and how righteous he was. And, and Jesus tells us he didn't go home justified. Uh, his prayer was not effective in, in furthering his relationship with God. Uh, the other guy, he, he was sorrowful, humble, and his prayer turned out to be effective. Now, sorrowful, uh, besides what he said, uh, we're told that, you know, um, he stood off by himself at a distance, would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast, uh, which was a sign of sorrow, a sign of mourning, or, or uh, you know, just disdain, you know, that despair, uh, kind of a woe is me symbol. And so with that kind of an attitude, uh, he prayed, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, that's the guy who went home justified before God. Uh, and remember, uh, this guy's a tax collector, uh, which, you know, in our minds, we don't like the IRS guys, you know, most Americans <laughs> don't like them. But not the same situation back then. Uh, I, and I know I've told you before, let me remind you again, uh, Israel is living under Roman occupation. They have been conquered, and the Roman army's there, and they have a Roman governor, and they have all these things uh, that are kind of above their own Jewish laws and, and what they're doing. Uh, and it is the Roman government not Israel that's collecting taxes. It's not tax with representation. Uh, it's the Roman government, and they have hired Jews, local Jews, to do the work of collecting the taxes and turning it over to Rome. And the way these guys made their money, of course, was by overcharging the taxes and keeping the difference. Uh, and so they were hated by everybody. Uh, they were the lowliest. They were considered kind of traitors, because they were working for the Roman government and they were stealing from the people to further their own pockets. Uh, doesn't get to be much of a worse sinner than that in the people's eyes. And Jesus is like that guy, that simple prayer, sitting home justified in God's eyes. Uh, you know, his, his sins were forgiven and cleansed uh, because of that simple prayer. Uh, <clears throat> Any Lost in Space fans? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Before Will Robinson uh, became aware, uh, the robot would recognize danger coming, and he would come in with his arms, danger, danger, Will Robinson. Uh, and that thought came to me at this point, because there's a danger here in this passage. And so we need to be alert to the danger. What is the danger? Uh, well, basically, uh, the bad example that Jesus gave us was pretty extreme. It was very extreme. Uh, he was kind of exaggerating. You know, it was a parable, not a true story. Uh, Jesus, you know, made this up to, to illustrate a point, and uh, he picked a Pharisee that was probably worse than most of the other Pharisees. Uh, how, would they really be that bad? To go to the temple and say, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Now, they might have felt that. <laughs> they might have believed that, but did they actually do that? Uh, this is an exaggerated thing. And the problem with that is it's easy for us to excuse ourselves and even pat ourselves on the back uh, because we aren't that bad. We wouldn't do that. You know, I would never come in here and, and, and you know, publicly in my prayer, thank God that I'm not like you guys. Uh, and, uh, you know, start bragging about what I do. Uh, that's not the way we would do it, you know. Um, but that don't mean that we don't do it in less subtle ways. 
we can still have that attitude. And the point is that less blatant self-righteousness is still self-righteousness. So don't let yourself off the hook because you're not as bad as the Pharisee in the story. Uh, and that's the danger, that we'll excuse our, oh, I'm not that bad, phew. Uh, but consider yourself. Uh, do you struggle with a little bit of self-righteousness? Do you uh, look at, uh, at some sinner that you know and, and kind of have that attitude that you're better than they are? Uh, that, you know, you're thankful that you're not like them? Uh, and I, I know I've shared multiple times, you think, oh, not that story again. Uh, but the story is told of Dwight Moody uh, walking down the sidewalk with another guy. And they look across the street, and there's a Lionel stumbling down the sidewalk. And uh, the guy with uh, Dwight L. Moody's like, look at that guy. And he shakes his head. And you could tell it was kind of a, a put downy. You know. And Dwight L. Moody said, there, by the grace of God, go I. And so we need to kind of remember that and, and realize that our righteousness comes from God, uh, not from, uh, from ourselves. So I want to move on, a uh, short message today, uh, to an important by the way. And I, I kind of hate that I decided to call it that because it's too important to consider it a by the way. Uh, but it wasn't really the main gist of my message today, so I kind of labeled it a by the way. And here's what the by the way is. If you are sitting here today, and you don't already know Jesus, if you are not already saved, or born again, uh, or if you haven't uh, you know, asked Jesus into your heart, and we have a lot of phrases that, that, that talk about that, if you're not that, then this good example prayer that Jesus gave is the perfect, simple prayer for you. Uh, people can, oh, you know, well, I don't, I don't know what to say. How, what do I have to do? Uh, and we kind of overcomplicate things. Uh, but, but this simple prayer, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. How easy is that? That's the perfect prayer for you if you haven't prayed it already or a form of it already. In fact, uh, that prayer is has been named or labeled the sinner's prayer. And I want to share uh, four things that kind of make it the perfect prayer if you still need to come to know Jesus. Uh, and the first thing about it is that it shows sorrow. And I already explained that, that partly that was reflected in the, the body language uh, that was taking place uh, besides the words. But there's this idea that the person is, you know, in despair. They're, they're struggling with their position. Uh, and so, uh, so that sorrow uh, is a part of that. The second thing to notice is that it calls on God for action. Uh, the guy doesn't say, Man, I've got to get another self-help book and, and set my goals and, and work on this. Uh, he calls out for God to do something uh, because he realizes that if this is going to be fixed, uh, if he's going to be forgiven and if he's going to be saved or born again, it's going to have to be God that does something, not just himself doing something. And so... Uh, the sinner's prayer to come to the Lord, acknowledging that you need God, uh, is part of that. Uh, the third thing is, is that it asks for mercy, not what is deserved. Uh, you know, how many times have you heard or seen someone there, I've done it myself, you know, kind of a, in a roundabout way. Tell the boss you deserve a raise. And when you do that, you say, look, I've been here X number of years, I did this uh, amount of work, I took on this extra responsibility, I saved the company X dollars last year, and uh, you know, you kind of make your case for why you deserve the raise. In the sinner's prayer, he's not coming to God and saying, God, have mercy on me because uh, I deserve it. Uh, give me what I've earned. <laughs> give me what I deserve. Uh, be fair to me. Give... That's not what he's praying. 
He's praying, have mercy. Uh, you know, mercy, not justice, is really what we need from God. If we were getting what we deserved, there's the scripture, the wages of sin is death. Uh, you know, you earn those wages, that's what you, did, that's what you get paid for what you've done. Uh, we don't want that. We want God to have mercy on us instead of giving us what we deserve. And so this prayer, have mercy on me, reflects that. The fourth thing is that it acknowledges sinfulness. Uh, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's that admission that, that I'm a sinner. Uh, I've committed these sins. That they're, they're weighing on me. Uh, and so that becomes uh, part of the, uh, of the sinner's prayer. Those four simple things... Uh, showing sorrow for your sinfulness, admitting that you're sinful, uh, showing dependence on God to do something, uh, and asking for mercy, you know, the grace of God, not, not what you've got coming to you. Um, in fact, I heard somebody, one person say that, that it's kind of ironic that, uh, you know, imagine a farmer um, sowing his seeds and asking God to not let there be a harvest. That's really what we're doing. <laughs> uh, we're telling God, I've sown these seeds, I've sinned this, that I deserve it, but now I want you to not give that to me. <laughs> I want you to change up what's coming to me uh, and, and have grace and mercy on me. So, uh, so let me encourage you, if uh, you're here today and haven't already uh, prayed that simple prayer to the Lord, any time is, is a good time. Now is the best time. Uh, you can do it right now in your own heart. Uh, in fact, I'm going to pause for just a few seconds in case somebody wants to pray that prayer. So I'm going to ask everyone to, to bow your heads and close your eyes, uh, a prayerful uh, attitude uh, for just a moment in case somebody wants to pray that. We'll give them a chance to do that. And then, uh, before we dismiss, before we close, uh, I want to give you another important by the way. And, and again, I hesitate to call it a by the way because it's important. And that one is, for those of you who have already prayed that in the past, those of you who know the Lord, those of you who have that relationship, those of you who have been forgiven, we want to share our faith. We want to help other people find that relationship and get through it, and we sometimes struggle, well, how do I do it? Um, <laughs> if you share your faith, and you want to help someone pray for their salvation, this prayer is the perfect model for you. Uh, someone says to you, well, how, how do I, uh, uh, you know, what do I do? You can say, you know, Jesus told a story about a guy who prayed, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, and we're told that God justified that person. And so there's your perfect biblical model. Uh, you can go to Luke 18, um, you know, verse 14, or verses uh, 12 and 14, no, uh, 13 and 14, uh, and, and use that uh, as you uh, lead someone to the Lord. Uh, doesn't get much simpler than that. Uh, and, you know, if, if, you're, if they're the kind of person who likes logic and reason for everything. You can talk about those four things, that it's showing dependence to God and showing sorrow and admitting they're a sinner and uh, asking for mercy, not what they deserve. Uh, and it's all included in that. And so that's, that's also a little uh, sharing your faith lesson um, for, as a part of this message. Let's pray.